cleanse my guilt and pride. Blood of Christ the Unleavened Bread Ministries presents from your hands your feet. Unleavened Bread Bible Studies with Jesus David Eels. What can quench my thirsting soul? Purest water made me whole. Let your streams of mercy flow, oh Jesus. Greetings, saints. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today for the Unleavened Bread Bible Study. Let's ask our Lord for His help. Glory be to God. Father, oh Lord, we can really do nothing without you. We ask your grace today, Lord. We ask that you uh, teach us today, Lord. We invite you to take over this vessel and um, share some, some good nuggets with our brethren, Lord something that will really edify us and build us up and prepare us to know what you expect of us, Father. And uh, not only that, what you've done for us, um, not only what you expect, but what you expect to do through us. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your goodness towards us, Lord. Amen. We've been studying um, the man-child and the bride. And um, I covered some territory last time in Esther chapter 3 that I'd like to Go back over briefly this time. See, maybe look at a few more things. Um, we've already so seen that um, the bride is chosen from all the fair virgins of the kingdom because she pleased the Holy Spirit. And um, the Holy Spirit is the only one that really knows what the Lord likes. He is... Um, he knows the mind of the Lord because He is the Spirit of God. So, um, Esther was found to be the most beautiful, the most dressed up, the most glorious garment because she pleased the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit knew just what the Lord likes, right? And then we came to chapter 3 and we saw the beast. The beast is part of dressing up the bride and the priest is very important to bring repentance as we're going to see you know um, chapter 3 and verse 1 it says after these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman the son of Hamadatha the Agagite and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him and all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed down and did reverence to Haman, as we've seen represents the beast. We're going to look at a little bit more of that too today. Um, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not down, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants that were in the king's gate said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass... When they spake daily unto him, that he hearkened not unto them, and that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. And um, we see that Mordecai was accused to Haman the beast. And uh, all the types and shadows we see in the scriptures, folks, the ones doing the accusing is um, the false people of God and their false prophets as their head. The harlot and the false prophet, that's what these people represent, accusing Mordecai, like they accused Jesus, the man-child. Mordecai, the man-child, and Jesus, the man-child. And um, like the brothers of Joseph um, sold him into bondage to the to the Gentiles, to the beast, right? So many types in the scriptures we can see here. But I'd like to point out to you that uh, a little bit more about Haman, because I'm sure some of you may wonder, well, maybe David hadn't given me enough information to me really to see that this Haman represents the head of the beast here. Uh, back to verse 1, it says, After these things, did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advance him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him? Why 
Why would God do that? Why would the husband of the bride do that? Promote um, this evil man to um, rule over God's people. Well, he has done it throughout history. We just have to read the Bible to see that he's done it over and over and over. He's always done it in a time when it was necessary for God's people to come to repentance. It was necessary for them to go to their cross. You know, the Lord Jesus is a type for us. He represented the body of Christ being crucified. Who did it? Well, the harlot was necessary to be the accuser, the false prophets over the harlot to be the accuser, um, and the beast kingdom at that time, Rome, was necessary to bring crucifixion to the body of Christ. And you know what Jesus said? If you don't take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. You know, we are here to die. God has sent some help. We need to understand that he is sovereign and that everything he sends into our life is necessary. Um, and Haman here, by the way, was an Agagite. You know, that points us out something. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, um, in verse 32, Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came with cheerfully. And uh, Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Well, notice that Agag was the king of the Amalekites. In other words, we see that Haman was royalty. You know, he came from Agag. He came from the king over a beast kingdom that made war on God's people, one of the lesser beast kingdoms, kind of like the Philistines, not the larger ones like Egypt and Assyria and Babylon. But nevertheless, in the text, it always represents a beast kingdom. At this time, by the way, we see that, um, that actually... God spoke to Saul and told him to go out and to kill these Amalekites and um, wipe them out totally, just destroy them, man, woman, and child. And uh, even their beasts he didn't want. He wanted all them destroyed. And uh, Saul began to reason and have pity upon this beast kingdom. You know, God wants us to be totally pitiless against this old beast that we live in right here. It's a part of this this world system, it has affinity for this world system. He wants that old flesh to be crucified. He cannot accept a renewed flesh. You cannot teach the flesh. You cannot make it holy. It has to die. And um, Saul had pity upon the very enemy of the spiritual man, which is the Jew. And God said, no, don't do that. Kill them all. It was a type and a shadow, not of God's uh, merciless way towards lost mankind. That's not what it's representing. What it's representing is the flesh. The flesh is the enemy of God. You have to lose your life to gain your life. The old man, the Amalekite, has to die. He's not permitted in the kingdom. Saul had pity upon him, and guess what? He lost his position in the kingdom because of that. And um, Samuel knew this. Samuel knew this, this was necessary. And so, what did Samuel say to Agag? He said, As thy sword hath made women childless. Think about that. We've talked about women being childless. We talk about women representing the people of God in different sects and divisions, and, and childless being not bringing forth fruit. And guess who it is that's guilty of of that more than any it's the old man it's the flesh uh, the beast that dwells in you you know uh, that's caused many to be childless many not to bear fruit and, and of course the fruit we want to bear is the man child jesus christ in our life right he that doeth the will of my father is my mother jesus said and uh, so if we do the will of uh, the father uh, we will be the mother of Jesus Christ. We will bring forth the fruit of Jesus Christ. Well, the flesh fights against this. As long as the flesh lives, you'll never bring forth Jesus Christ. As the outer man is decaying, the inner man is being renewed day by day. That outer man has to die. 
That outer man is the beast in your life. And he will give in to that harlot religion. And uh, together they'll make war against your spiritual man, the one who is being born and being birthed in the, in the image of Jesus. So it's necessary that he die. Samuel wasn't going to have any pity on him. He chewed him, hewed him in pieces with his sword, you know. And, and we should too. We should put to death that old man, be totally merciless towards him, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and just hew him in pieces. Put him to death. Well, anyway, Agag here was the, the leadership over the Amalekites. Do you know that the um, Amalekites came from Eliphaz, who was the son of Esau? Eliphaz, you remember Eliphaz the Temanite in the book of Job, who was one of the persecutors of Job? And uh, that kind of dates the book of Job to be right after the time of Esau. And um, Eliphaz brought forth the Amalekites. And the Amalekites made war on God's people. And um, we can see, for instance, in um, Exodus uh, chapter 17, from 8 on down to the end of the chapter, is a story of Israel in their wilderness time. Um going to war with the Amalekites. Did you know that, um, that also the sons of, um, of Esau and Eliphaz uh, inhabited portions of the promised land? And you know, in a way, we're the promised land because uh, the old man that lives in this land, Hebrews chapter 6 calls us the land that's supposed to bear fruit when the rain comes upon it. Otherwise, it's good for nothing but to be thrown into the fire, Paul tells us there. And uh, so uh, this old man in the land has to be put to death by the spiritual man. God told the Jews, you go in there, you take your sword, you conquer them, you kill them, you take their land, you raise your crops, your fruit in that land. And, of course, this is the story because those people inhabited the land of promise, and they had to be put to death in order for the spiritual man to live. We see that same story in the book of Esther. We see the beast making war upon the saints. Do you know which beast it is that makes war on you more than any other? It's this one. It's in total agreement with the world. The lusts of the flesh, right? The lusts of the flesh represent the tribes of the Canaanites that had to be put to death so that the Spiritual man could dwell in that land. Well, here's the story here. Um, Exodus 17 and verse 8, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So uh, Joshua did as Moses had said unto him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. So he was on the rock, right? <laughs> the rock being Jesus, right? And he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Wow, what do you think that represents, um, standing up there with your hands sticking out on both sides of you? It kind of looks like the cross, doesn't it? Well, I think that's exactly what God's wanting us to see here. And um, Aaron and her, Aaron being the um, meaning light, the meaning for light, and um, her being a meaning for uh, splendor or whiteness, uh, purity. You know, um, our desire for these things and the support that we receive from these things from scriptures, of course, enables us to be able to stay on our cross 
And you know what? We're going to be winning the battle as long as we're on our cross. I mean, I know that Moses here represents in one form the man child and Aaron and her two witnesses, you know. But also, there's another parable here. That is, as long as we're on our cross, we're going to be winning our battle against our enemy. That is the beast, because we're crucifying him. Let me read on. Verse 13 says, And Joshua discomforted Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword, as long as those, his hands were up, right? If he let his hands down, no cross, right? No cross, no crown. And uh, they began to win the battle, right? And the Lord said unto, jo unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. That I may, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Wow, God is going to totally destroy the beast, and He's going to do it in our coming days. You know, uh, I will totally blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. That is the Lord my banner, right? The Lord is my banner, Jehovah Nisi. And he said, The Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Well, um, truly in our generation, the Lord is making war with Amalek. And as long as, our, as we're bearing our cross, we will be winning this battle. And we have to Bear, we have to, like the Apostle Paul says, die daily, right? Well, let me point out to you that um, verse 16, it says, The Lord has sworn. And uh, actually, I've got a footnote in my Bible that the Hebrews says, A hand is lifted up upon the throne of Jehovah. A hand is lifted up upon the throne of Jehovah. What is it that God is saying? that he has already given us the victory, he's already given us the authority to win this battle. You know, just as Moses' arms were lifted up, the Lord says he's got an arm lifted up on the throne, right? He's already given us authority to win this battle against the old man, against the flesh, against the, against the inhabitant of our promised land. And it's been promised to us to rule this land, you see. It's been promised to the spiritual man to rule because the old man has been crucified with Christ. And the only one left is the new man, the spiritual man. We accept by faith the fact that the Lord has already given us the victory because he's already put the death, the old man, on the cross. And so when we see, you know, in Esther that Haman is the son of um, Hamadatha, which means um, the father of Haman, um, the Agagite, which is, of course, the, the, um, the leader of Amalek, which is the uh, people who warred against God's people, that um, God has given us the victory over him already, and we should accept it now. And even the people, the false prophet and um, the harlot who accused um, uh, Mordecai, before Haman. They've all been conquered. Their purpose is, is part of God's plan to bring us to the place where we must accept our cross and, um, and let the old man die. Not the old man around us, the old man in us. The most important conquering of the beast is this beast. You know, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon said that man is a beast, right? We together make up the beasts, right? The beasts of this world and corporate beasts of this world. And so, you know, as we read on down, um, we see um, that Haman in verse 5 um, saw that Mordecai bowed not down, nor did him reverence. Then was Haman full of wrath, but he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had made known unto him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom 
of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. The beast wants to destroy all of the people of God. And he has an ordination in these days to do that. And as we're going to see, God's going to give him authority to do that if he can. You know, the beast has authority to, to make just as much um, ground against you as he is able, as you will give him. You see, we're the ones that has to give authority to the old man to conquer us. You know, if you walk after the flesh, you must die. And, of course, that death is not talking about a physical death. It's talking about a spiritual death. You die spiritually if you give in to the old man, if you walk after the flesh. And he is, of course, one of the corporate body of the beast, right? And let's read on from verse 7 on. First of all, it says, the people of Mordecai. The Jews, all the Jews were the people of Mordecai. Mordecai was the representative head of all of the Jews. And, uh, but not only that, he, he is the head of all the people that don't bow down to Haman, right? The, the true Jew is not going to bow down to Haman. If he does bow down, what does that identify him as? A, a member of the body of the beast. And when we read the rest of the story of the book of Esther, you notice that the people of God are saved. The true Jews are saved from the beast through the workings of both Mordecai and Esther and uh, the power of God. They are saved from the beast. Again, we want to see that death here represents uh, spiritual death. You know, um, we'll get to that in a minute, but I want to point out to you why is it, why is it, that God is giving authority to the beast to make war on the people of God. Here it is right here. Let's read verse 7. In the first month, which is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, which is the month Adar. And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are different or diverse from those of every people. It's so true with us, right? We are the people of God. Our laws are totally different from all those of the people around us. Uh, neither keep they the king's laws. This is the problem right here. He is being accused. The accuser is coming before the king, the Lord, and telling him that your people don't keep your word. They don't keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. <clears throat> what does our king know? Our king knows that the problem, the reason why we do not keep his laws is because of that beastly flesh. And it has to be crucified so that the spiritual man takes over this vessel and that Jesus Christ lives in us and that we're able to walk the walk. And so there has to be a crucifixion for this to come to pass. You see, God is doing everything for our good, folks. People uh, <clears throat> say that God will not bring them into tribulation, would not bring them under the beast kingdom, that they'll never see the beast kingdom. They haven't read the Bible because historically um, repeated throughout the scriptures is God turning his rebellious people, it's always because of their rebellion, over to this crucifixion uh, consistently throughout the Bible he does this. In fact, I'm going to point out one I, that I partially pointed out to you before, Ezekiel 17. Ezekiel 17 is uh, the story of Babylon conquering the people of God, bringing them under submission, their leadership and their people under submission, Babylon. And uh, I shared with you um, that there are seven verses, you know, from... Um, uh, verse 12 on down, there are seven verses in which um, the word covenant is mentioned. 
And in the middle of those seven verses, I'm not going to go through it again because we've talked about it. In the middle of those seven verses, the covenant is broken. And um, the word covenant is mentioned in those seven verses six times, which is the number of the beast. And the word covenant in the middle of the seven verses and three and a half verses, the word covenant is broken, is spoken. Uh, covenant he break, verse 16. And then it goes on for three and a half more verses. But God says, listen to what God says. He says in verse 12, Say now to the rebellious house, Know ye not what these things mean? Tell them, behold, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and took the king thereof and the princes thereof and brought them to him unto Babylon. He took control over the people of God, took control over their reprobate leadership, took control over the people of God. God did this because they were rebellious. Matter of fact, you go down to verse 19 after the, the uh, seven verses are mentioned, and he says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, as I live, surely mine oath that he hath despised, and my covenant that he hath broken, I will even bring it upon his own head. You see, he's talking about the king of God's people, which represents the leadership of God's people today. And he says that they have broken his covenant. This is the reason he has allowed the beast to bring them into this bondage. Once again, in verse 20, And I will spread my net upon him, and he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon, and I will enter into judgment with him there for his trespass, that he hath trespassed against me. The leadership of God's people are going into bondage to the beast, just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees went into bondage to the Roman beast for the purpose of bringing God's people into that bondage. And so, God, once more, is just repeating history. He just does it all the way through the Scriptures, repeating history, repeating history. Don't think you're going to fly away and miss the beast. The beast has a purpose. The harlot has a purpose. And the purpose is to sanctify you. They are vessels of dishonor that God uses to help you to your cross. We don't necessarily mean a physical cross, but a cross of death to self. And... Um, and so after Haman had um, recounted before the king why it was necessary for him to bring them to this persecution and crucifixion, it says in verse 9, If it please the king, let it be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those that have charge of the king's business to bring it into the king's treasuries. Well, you remember that Joseph was bought for silver and Jesus was bought for silver, right? And um, by the harlot who was in bed with the beast of that time, right? And the king took off his ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy the ring representing the king's authority, and he gave the king's authority to the Jew's enemy. To do what? To wipe them out. To wipe them out. The beast has been given authority to make war upon the saints, to crucify the old man, put to death the old man, right? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Many people think that it's a bad thing. Oh, God would never do that. Well, well, just Jesus said, if you don't lose your life, you won't gain your life. Now, how many does it take to put you and me on the cross? Well, God's built a whole world to do that, folks. He's built all of our enemies to do that. He has built, um, he's put together this harlot system around us uh, to be the Judases to come against us, to accuse us. And he's built a beast kingdom there too, to take up the sword against us, you know, and to make war upon the saints. And uh, Jeremiah 27, let me read that to you. Jeremiah 27 is the story of, of the natural people of God and their surroundings. I mean, he spoke, speaks in 27 and 1 of Judah 
and in verse 2 of Edom and Moab and Ammon and Tyre and uh, all the nations around natural Israel, which is a type of what? Spiritual Israel, which is, is who? That's God's people. Those who are um, circumcised in heart. That's who a Jew is, according to Paul in Romans chapter 2, right? Those who are circumcised in heart. Okay, So we take this type in the shadow and we, we see in it ourselves here. Because everything that happened unto them is for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age have come, right? Verse 6. Now I have given all these lands, that's the whole Middle East, folks, he's talking about, into the hand, and of course, by type and shadow, the people of God and the people around them, right? Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. Well, this was a pagan king and uh, um, one who came to know the Lord, I admit, but um, when he conquered them, he was a pagan king and um, a beast nation. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant, he called him. And the beasts of the field also have I given him to serve him. And all the nations shall serve him. And his son and his son's son until the time of his own land to come. Yes, Babylon, the great eagle, will have their time to fall. But before that, they will they are, have been given authority, not as vessels of honor, but vessels of dishonor over the whole world in order to do what? In order to bring God's people into bondage, as we're going to read here. And many nations and great kings shall make him their bondman. That is when their time, when Babylon's time is up, when the great eagle's time is up. We read in Ezekiel 17 that Babylon was called the great eagle. When their time is up, the, the other nations will conquer them and bring them into bondage. And verse 8, And it shall come to pass that the nation and the kingdom which will not serve the same Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon, that will not put their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation will I punish, says the Lord. With the sword, with famine, with pestilence, will I, until I have consumed them by his hand. But as for you, hearken you not, to your prophets, nor to your diviners, nor to your dreams, nor to your soothsayers, nor to your sorcerers that speak unto you, saying, You shall not serve the king of Babylon. In other words, you're not going under the beast. <laughs> Do you hear that? Almost everywhere in apostate Christianity. You're not going under the beast. Oh, yes. The, the, go read Second Thessalonians chapter 2 again, folks. Oh, yes. It definitely tells us that we are. Verse 10, For they prophesy a lie unto you to remove you far from your land, that I should drive you out and you should perish. Why? Because unless you are crucified by the beast, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. And so, as desperate as God's people want to escape the beast, they don't understand. They, they're trying to escape heaven. You know, because God's plan is to bring God's rebellious people under this crucifixion. He said that I should drive you out, that you should perish. But the nations that shall bring their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, that nation will I let remain in their own land. You know why? Because the old man's going to be put to death. They're going to rule the land. How many times was... Israel as a type and a shadow driven from their land because of their rebellion. They defiled the land with their works. Why? Because in them the Canaanite lived, in them the beast lived. They were defiling their land. The curse was devouring the earth as it is today. The curse is devouring the earth because God's people are doing it their way. They don't, they don't want the old man to die. They want to favor the beast kind of like Saul did oh have pity on the beast let's save him you know but Samuel said uh -uh, we're going to cut him in pieces not, not even leave a little piece left you know and uh, so the lesson that we're seeing here is the same thing God is giving authority to the beast can he give authority to the beast and God's people at the same time 
Yes, he can. That's the whole point, you know. Um, let me, let's, let's read on here. It says, and the king, we're back in Esther chapter 3, okay. And the king said unto Haman, the silver is given thee, the people also, to do with them as it seemeth good unto thee. See, in other words, do whatever you can do. <laughs> and uh, and it goes on to say, Then were the king's scribes called in the first month on the thirteenth day thereof. And there was written according to all that Haman commanded unto the king's satraps and to the governors that were over every province and the princes of every people to every province according to the writing thereof and to every people after their language. In other words, this beast, folks, is a beast over the whole earth. He's been given authority over the whole earth to crucify a people, not just in tiny Israel, folks, the whole world. Everybody's got their eye on little Israel over there thinking the beast is going to come against them. He's going to be in their sanctuary. and so They are missing the point in the New Testament. They're missing the point. The beast is going to make war and is going to take dominion over the whole earth, the Scripture says, Daniel chapter 7. What For what purpose? To bring God's people to maturity. Right? And so, when was this? This was on the 13th day. Isn't that interesting? The 13th day. In Genesis 14 and verse 4, let me point something out to you here. The, four, the 13th year, they rebelled against the beasts, against the kings that ruled over the land. It says in the 13th year, verse 4 here. And what happened here? Well, it's, I think, something that we need to pay attention to. Um, uh, the rebellion we saw in, in Ezekiel 17 was the people of God rebelling in the midst of the tribulation. They saw the mark of the beast coming. They weren't content to just say, okay, I'll just say no. If they take off my head, fine. Not a problem. I'm, I'm going right straight into the presence of the Savior. But, you know, people don't want to lose their life to gain their life. Jesus said we must lose our life to gain our life. That's not always physically. I've admitted that before. Sometimes it's spiritually. Day by day, we have to lose our life. We have to give up our dominion, the old man's dominion over this life, and let him die. Just let him die, you see. Well, we need some help to get this all done quickly before the end. You see, that's why God is raising up the beast. Well, the beast, the kings. You remember Revelation 17, how the kings ruled over the earth? They were the uh, rulers over the beast kingdom. They ruled over the earth, okay? and uh, But they rebelled here. Uh, 13, this is the first mention of 13, by the way, and first mention means something in the Scriptures. Um, 13 is the number of rebellion. God's people are in rebellion, just as Haman said to the king. You know, they won't keep your laws. They've got laws different from everybody else, and they don't even keep your laws. And so they were in rebellion, as we saw in Ezekiel 17, too. God accused them. He didn't accuse the beast. He said the beast was his servant. The beast was doing just what it was ordained to do. He was being very obedient <laughs> in crucifying the people of God. It's the people of God who are being rebellious. They weren't going to do their part to give up and die and lose their life, you see. Well, here, the 13th year they rebelled and guess what happened in the text here in four, chapter 14 is God's people including Lot who represented the carnal people of God were taken into bondage by the beast and here comes Abram he gets wind of it and God sends him to deliver God's people out of bondage to the beast now Abram represents the man child uh, delivering the people of God uh, from bondage to the beast. And uh, guess what? The man-child also um, comes face to face with uh, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, verse 18. That's the prince of peace. 
He's he that's without father, without mother, mother, without earthly genealogy. He's coming face to face with the Lord. He's seen the face of the Lord and he's delivered the people of God from the beast kingdom. 13. So 13 represents the same thing here as it represents over in Esther chapter 3, which we're back over there now. The 13th day. Uh, Haman is uh, given authority. And he um, speaks basically to the whole world, basically speaking here, every province of the king's uh, dominion. And of course, that would be the whole world to us. Every people after their language, all the languages of the world, right? You see that? Uh, in the name of King Asuerus, what was it written? And it was sealed with the king's ring. And this is what the Lord gave the beast authority to do, okay? Verse 13. <laughs> there it is again, 13. And uh, the letters were sent by posts unto all the king's provinces to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the 13th day. There it is, the day of rebellion. Okay, you're going to rebel. Our flesh rebels. Our flesh don't want to serve God. It doesn't want to humble ourselves to this word. This word is crucifying. See, if you obey this word, you will die. What did they say to Moses? Moses, don't let us hear the voice of God. If we hear his voice, we'll die. You know, they didn't want to climb that mountain which represented the kingdom of God. They didn't want to come face to face with God. They didn't want to hear his voice. They'd die. Well, it's true. We have to die. And to hear, if we do hear his voice, we will die because the water of the word is, is the baptism that we're to be baptized with. You know, baptism is a type of the death of the old man, the death of the beast, right? And what is it that kills him? The washing of the water with the word, right? Am I talking against natural baptism? No, I'm not because natural baptism is a... Um, an act of faith whereby we are united with Christ in the likeness of the death of the old man and the resurrection of the new man, right? You come up out of the water and now Jesus lives in you. No longer does the old man live. Now Jesus lives. That's what baptism is about. You're, you're accepting this by faith, you see. But then, after you're through with your baptism, are you going to continue to walk in that baptism by letting the washing of the water with the word put to death the old man? The old beast, right? The beast in your life. The one um, the one that's in rebellion against God. See? The flesh is at enmity with the spirit. These two are contrary one to another, the scripture says. That you might not do the things that you should. You know, the old man has to die so that the new man can rule. That's what holiness is. That's what sanctification is, is the new man ruling. He is created in the image of Jesus Christ. He is the spiritual man, right? So the command went forth into all areas of the world under the dominion of the king and uh, under the authority of the beast to bring it to pass, right? even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. And a copy of the writing uh, that the decree should be given out in every province was published unto all the peoples that they should be ready against that day. Well, here we go, folks. Now, now what does this mean? Yeah, we kind of touched on it already. What does this mean? Um, the crucifixion of the Jews by the beast kingdom. You know, is everybody going to die? No, obviously not. But we do have Revelation 20 and 4, which tells us that there are those who are beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. And, uh, I, you know, frankly, there's something spiritual about that too. We, we, um, we, the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're supposed to be making Jesus our head, right? We grow up into all things into him who is the head. We're making Jesus our head. We have to be beheaded in a very spiritual way. We have to be beheaded. We have to lose that old mind of the flesh. 
The mind of the flesh is death. The mind of the spirit is life and peace, the scripture says. So in a spiritual way, I suppose some people will uh, lose their head before they have to lose their head. <laughs> you see, if you don't enter into it in the spirit, you'll have to enter into it in the flesh. But there, in, in one way or the other, we all have to die. There is only one way into the kingdom. You must die. The old man must die to enter the kingdom. If you don't lose your life, you will not gain your life. That's a deception by religion that we don't have to give up our life and be crucified. We have to take up our cross and follow Jesus or we are not his disciple. Let's listen to what the Word of God says. That, you know, religion has pretty well designed itself to escape any kind of persecution, tribulation. Oh, no, we're not going into that tribulation. We don't want to go there. You know, God wouldn't drag his mud through the... His, his bride, excuse me, through the mud, they say. You know, they love to come up with these little cliches, you know, that don't make any sense whatsoever uh, when you're talking about the spirit realm. Yeah. And so we also have um, Revelation 13, which tells us that the beast is going to make war on the saints and overcome them. What part of the saints are going to be overcome? Let's hope it's not the spiritual man. Let's hope it's the carnal man, right? And obviously the beast um, that crucified the body of Christ in the book of Acts, it was only the old man. It was only the physical life that was able to be put to, to death there, you see. He couldn't touch the spiritual man. It was the old man that had to die. And so it is with us, too. You know, the old man has to die. All of the Jews, if you read the rest of the book of Esther, it's very strange, but all of the Jews escaped. Isn't that interesting? You know why? Because the Jews, not the old man, that's the Canaanite. The Jew is the spiritual man. All of the true Jews, that is those who are crucified in heart, right? A Jew is one whose circumcision is inwardly, see, in the circumcision of the heart, not outwardly in the circumcision of the flesh. Why is that? Because the circumcision is the cutting off of the flesh. It's the cutting off of the old man. That's why all the Jews in the book of Esther escaped. They all escaped. Everybody that's a true Jew is one who is circumcised. That is, the old man is cut off. That Jew is the spiritual man, not the carnal man. The carnal man is the one who is cut off in circumcision, you see. So when we read the rest of the book of Esther, we have this paradox we have to think about. Number one, when we, re we read in Revelation, we find out that truly some people are going to lose their lives. Listen, if you don't lose your life, you have to lose your life. <laughs> see, if you don't lose your carnal life, that spiritual entity, the old man, if you don't lose that, if he's not crucified, then you have to be crucified because you have to enter into life through death. Everybody does. Everybody does. So we see apparently in the scriptures that, um, that the Jews are going to escape. Well, if you go to Jude, for instance, go with me to Jude. Let me read something to you here. One verse, verse 12 says, These are they who are hidden rocks in your love feasts when they feast with you, shepherds that without fear feed themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit. They're trees without fruit. Clouds without water. The water is the life of the Word of God in you, right? Carried along with the winds, blown about by every wind of doctrine, right? Autumn trees without fruit. Twice dead and plucked up by the roots. Well, now here's some living people that God is, in other words, physically living, that God is saying they're twice dead. 
plucked up by the roots. That means they're plucked out of the kingdom of God. They're no longer a part of the kingdom of God. How can you be twice dead if you're not twice born? Here is a people who were dead in their sins. They were born again and died again. Not a physical death. A spiritual death. They're spiritual man because they started out walking by the Spirit but ended up walking in the flesh. The Bible says you walk after the flesh, you must die. Their spiritual man died. Can it happen? Oh, it does all the time. People who walk in the flesh, they're spiritual men. They're not feeding their spiritual man. They're feeding their carnal man. They're giving in to obeying the carnal man. And what happens when you do that? The spiritual man dies. They can't both live in the same territory, you see. In fact, you say, some of you are saying, oh, that can't happen. We're once saved, always saved. Oh, yeah, right. Well, look in verse 5 then. He says, now I desire to put you in remembrance, though you know all things once and for all, that the Lord, having saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. He afterwards destroyed them. You have to endure to the end in your faith to see salvation. Jesus said, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. At the beginning of your walk, you're saved by faith. But you have to endure in that faith. And when you walk by faith, let me tell you what you have from God. You have the gift of power from God when you walk by faith. And he enables you to live the crucified life. He enables you to turn away from the old man and let that man die from lack of sustenance you're not feeding him anymore because you're not giving him what he wants you know the the black dog white dog scenario right you take two dogs and you pen them up and you feed the black dog and you turn them loose you don't feed the white dog you turn them loose well the black dog's going to beat the white dog right you pen them up again you feed the white dog you don't feed the black dog you turn them loose well the white dog's going to beat the black dog and it's the same way, folks. It's, it's who you feed. It's who are you feeding. If you cease, if you fast, you stop feeding your flesh, and you feed the spiritual man, the Word of God, the breath of the Spirit of life, then your spiritual man's going to win. If not, he's going to die. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. We're talking about the real true Jews are those who are circumcised in heart, like the Apostle Paul said, Romans chapter 2. These people are all going to have the victory. They're going to, everything is going to be turned around. Whereas the beast was given authority over them, as we're going to see later, everything's going to be turned around. They're going to have authority over the beast. You see, if the spiritual man lives and the carnal man dies, it's because the spiritual man has authority over the beast. If it's the other way around, it's because the beast has authority. Can God give both authorities at the same time? Yes, he, he does. You can walk in the flesh or you can walk in the spirit. He gives both authorities at the exact same time. And we're going to see that in our next study, how that he gives authority to the bride. He gives authority over the beast. And he's already right here given authority to the beast to kill all the people of God. You know, the beast in the world is in cooperation with the beast in the flesh. They are one nature. They're all the seed of the devil. You know, remember what Jesus told the Pharisees, you know, you're of your father the devil. They were born from beneath. Their nature came from him. It didn't come from God. There's a lot of people today that are like that. Oh, yeah, they, they claim to be Jews. Oh, we're sons of Abraham, they said. Oh, and there's many today that believe that they are children of God because they accepted Jesus as their personal Savior, but they're mean as a snake and um, born from beneath. The nature, that corrupt nature, that fallen nature, that judgmental, evil nature is from the devil. And they don't know it, but they've already been conquered. And so we have to lose our life. And that's, this is what it's all about. This is what we're here for. Jesus said, for this reason have I come into the world. And now he tells us, okay, now it's your turn. You take up your cross and follow me, or you're not my disciple. Okay. So we came into this world to die. We came into this world to lose 
this old man, this old flesh, this old beast. You know, the mark of the beast, folks, is going to be put on the people of the beast. It identifies them as members of the body of the beast. God also has a mark. It's in Revelation chapter 14, 1 through 5. It's his name in their forehead. Right? His name, his nature. The word name means nature, character, and authority. His nature in their forehead. They have the renewed mind. They've lost their head. They now have the renewed mind of Christ. Now, these Jews that escape the beast, that conquer the beast, that celebrate Purim, these are the people who have won their battle with the beast. And uh, guess what? A great repentance. After this dominion was given by the beast, suddenly God's people got serious with him. I'm going to read it, 4 and 3. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Wow, a great repentance. Well, would that have happened if God had not given his authority to the beast? No. God's people are not going to repent until they have to. They're not going to give up their life until they have to. We need somebody to drive the nails. Great repentance is coming when people realize, uh, well, at least those with discernment, those with eyes to see and ears to hear, when they realize, oh, I'm not flying away and I am going under this beast and he wants to kill me. Great repentance, great move of God is coming, folks. Glory be to God. God's plan is best. Um, be in prayer. We're going to study some more um, on this subject. Maybe two or three more times we'll study this. God bless you and thank you for being with us today. And uh, we love you. For more information and materials, go to www.americaslastdays.com.